probably put together a couple of pictures. Okay. Yeah, I have a couple too, yeah. Marcy, so if you got okay. a few minutes. Brooke and David. All right. So we're recording, so let's begin. Uh, it is Monday, September the 16th, 2024, Astro Cafe. And um, I would like to start by introducing Kirsten. Randy said to me, said, I said to all of us as hosts, that if there was something that we wanted to present or a speaker we had in mind, to please do so. So I asked Kirsten if she would do her presentation about um, her journey through beginning uh, telescopes. I heard Kirsten speak at the uh, DAO one Saturday evening, and I was, I was, I just, I loved what she said. So I'm going to offer you the opportunity to uh, hear what I heard. So here's a bit about Kirsten. Kirsten joined Victoria chapter of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada in 2023. While always interested in astronomy for as long as she can remember, Kirsten has been actively learning to navigate the sky and do field observing since joining RASC. Kirsten is the second vice president of the Victoria chapter, and she also volunteers as treasurer for the FDAO, Friends of the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory. Kirsten holds a Bachelor of Arts and a Master's of Public Administration from University of Victoria and retired in November 2023 from an almost 34 year long career with the province of British Columbia. While also enjoying music, running and yoga, she is looking forward to spending as much time as possible under the stars in her retirement. And she's made a darn good start so far. Kirsten. Well, thank you so much, Margie, for um, for the invitation and for thinking about me and um, and for that introduction. Um, I will um, I will share my screen here to get a my presentation. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. Um, let's see. There we go. Okay. Okay, so a beginner's telescope journey. So I, I'll start the presentation, um, which is essentially an overview of some of the really interesting and important aspects about telescopes that I've I've picked up along the way. But how this whole thing began for me, uh, I joined RASC in uh, September of 2023. And at that time, I was um, learning to just look at the sky uh, with my eyes uh, and 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 using binoculars, uh, primarily through the uh, Explore the Universe program, getting started with that. And I started to look at some of the other uh, RASC uh, national observing programs, and I was really intrigued by the Explore the Moon program. Um, so... At the November 2023 uh, buy-and-sell event, uh, and we have another one coming up, is my understanding, a bit later on this, this year as well, there was there happened to be uh, an opportunity to purchase for a really great price. It was perfect as, as a beginner. Um, it, was, it was considerably under $100. It was a great deal a little 90 millimeter Mac. And I saw it from across the room, very small and portable. And I, I, I asked, you know, the person who was selling it, what, what it, what it was. And the response I got back was, well, it's, it's great for observing the moon and planets. And that's about really kind of what I, that was my main takeaway at the time, as well as it being a, a great travel scope because it was very small and very portable, which is really what I was after. Like I had already, discovered about myself that um, 
having something large, heavy, bulky that was going to be a challenge, particularly taking up and down stairs, um, was going to be a bit of a problem for me. So I thought, well, that's great uh, for that price. Um, if it's good for the moon, um, that that would be that would be good. And here's um, here's a little picture of uh, I didn't get that to that type of mount, but um, the picture of the scope is essentially what I what I picked up. It's about three and a half inches, 90 millimeter uh, wide aperture, which is um, the part that uh, that collects the light. So it, it happened to be a full moon uh, that that very night that uh, that the buy and sell uh, was was on, and so when and it was clear as well. So when I I remember when I when I got home after the after the Astro Cafe, I took it out. Uh, it came with an eyepiece. I brought it out on my porch, uh, put the eyepiece in, and got the moon in there. It took me a bit to uh, to focus it. But uh, I got I got that done, and I was so pleased because I could tell once I I got the the moon basically filled the entire field of view, and I knew at that moment that um, I was going to be able to actually complete the program because uh, unlike binoculars, um, which are um, hard to hold for very very long periods of time without shaking. Um, that having a small scope like that would be really great to to observe the moon. So the start of my journey was, uh, okay, that's great. I mean, I, I, I have this great thing that I'll be able to observe the moon with, but the next day I was like, okay, but what is, what is it? <laughs> and so that, that was kind of the start of it for me. Like, I, so I, I Googled it, put the, put the information in about the brand, what it was, and I started to learn about different types of telescopes. Um, you know, for in the in the in my case, uh, with the small, uh, it's called a Maxitoff Cassegrain. It's it's what's known as a type of Cassegrain telescope. And there's various kinds, like there's Schmidt Cassegrains and Maxitoffs, and there's there's other variations as well. But it's a type of scope that that has different combinations of of mirrors and lenses. Um, it was developed uh, back in 1941. So fairly recently, actually, as far as telescopes go, uh, but uh, um, commercially sold since the 1950s. Um, and uh, just kind of learning what the what the little what the little scope was all about. And sold mainly in uh, kind of a three, three, three to five inch uh, kind of aperture size, although they definitely come larger um, and it's just known for the the quality of its sharp images it's got some advantages over refractors with respect to kind of I guess color or what's known as kind of uh, chromal ver um, aberration and false color but uh, it is really kind of a good little unit so I started to then figure out that uh, things like aperture in terms of the part of the scope that actually collects the light, the, the size of that, things like focal length, um, focal ratio, um, the type of diagonal that the scope had, um, the kind of tripod that it was on, and the type of finder that was on the scope, that all of these kinds of things actually started to matter. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about each of these things, um, just so uh, I can share, I guess, why I found things like focal length and focal ratio in particular to be very important to know about before one decides to invest any kind of serious money in terms of the type of equipment to have. But first, I'll talk about aperture, the light gathering ability, uh, determining the amount of light that can enter the scope. Pretty straightforward. The larger the aperture, the larger the light gathering ability, making many objects just appear brighter in the scope. And so what's important to know about that is depending on what you want to observe, um, if if deep sky objects like galaxies and nebulas 
are the objects of primary interest, then it makes sense to get a type of scope that has a larger ability to collect light because they're they're fainter and they need to have their brightness boosted. But the thing to know about that is as magnification increases, brightness decreases. So there's there's a trade-off there in terms of knowing how large you might want to go and what type of uh, magnification you may want. And that then brings us to these concepts of focal length and focal ratio. And focal length is, is uh, an interesting one because you can't really tell what the focal length of a telescope is by looking at it. In some cases you can, like, you know, like kind of that traditional stereotypical refractor that's got a really long telescope tube, you could probably guess, well, that must have a pretty long focal ratio because the distance from where the light enters the scope to the eyepiece is a pretty long way to go. And that's true. But there are types of scopes, and this is where we get into the Cassegrains, where the configuration of mirrors and lenses is such that the light's kind of bouncing back and forth kind of all through through the tube multiple times. And so they actually have very, very long focal lengths in terms of the distance that the, um, the light has to travel from uh, the entry point to the focuser or the eyepiece. And, uh, and that's what I happened to find with my... Um, my 90 millimeter Mac is that even though it was very small, it was this tiny little, little container, it actually had a very long focal length. And that is really important to determine what's known as focal ratio, which is something um, where once you figure out the focal length of the scope and you divide it by its aperture, that'll give you a focal ratio. So every telescope has a specific focal length and a focal ratio. And the reason why this is important to know is it will determine what the scope is best suited for. So in my case, when I got my 90 millimeter Mac, I figured out um, based on uh, the information I was able to research about it, that it had a focal length of 1250 millimeters. And when I divided that by a 90 millimeter aperture, it came up with a focal length or a focal ratio, sorry, of uh, F14, which is actually quite, it's considered, I'll use the term long. There's there's other terms, um, slow, but I'll, I'll, I'll stick with long uh, because again, the, the, that distance that light travels inside the scope. So there's three general categories. There's scopes that have very short focal ratios. There's scopes that have medium ones. And then there's scopes that have long ones. And why that's important is it goes to the types of magnifications and fields of view that, that telescopes have. So telescopes that have very long focal ratios, such as my first scope there, the, the 90 millimeter Mac, with a focal ratio of 14, it has capacity for very high magnification of objects, but it's got an extremely narrow field of view. So to give you a comparison, field of view is a really important concept in observing. And binoculars have about a five degree field of view when you look through them. And that's the equivalent. Um, there's a sort of like the, the three finger, um, kind of distance of your hand gives you a sense of what five degrees in the sky is. And that's kind of what you see, that, that amount of sky in a binocular. And the reason that 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 amount of field of view is so important is it it it's going to enable you to find things easily or not easily. And as a beginner, um, I can certainly speak for myself that having a large field of view or a wide field of view is really important because otherwise I would not be able to find hardly anything. And I, so, you know, learning with the binoculars and that 
that wide five degree field of view is really important to get to learn to know what things look like and having that wide that wide amount of thing. But uh, once you move to a telescope, especially scopes that have very long focal ratios and these high magnifications, the field of view is extremely small. It can be less than one degree, can actually be like half a degree, which is looking through like a tiny, tiny little straw into the sky. And that can be very challenging, particularly for a beginner to, to realize that and the difficulty with finding things. So I won't get into too much detail here, but it's important to know that the focal ratio of your scope combined with the type of eyepiece that you're using, and there's some formulas that I've got kind of in the slide, I won't spend too much time on that, but that the two things together, the focal length and ratio of your scope with the type of eyepiece and its kind of field of view will, will, will enable what you're kind of looking through. And so the key thing, the kind of key takeaway is long ratio scopes are really good for things that are like big and bright. So things like the moon and planets and small bright objects that you can find fairly easily, like with say a red dot finder. Um, they're, they're things like, so things like double stars or stars. So they're great for those kinds of things, but they're not uh, that, that recommended for deep sky objects. Something like a, a go-to mount system can be a really great option with those kinds of scopes because then you're not struggling so much with trying to find things through a very, very small um, field of view. So just something on to say about eyepieces, um, you know, as, as I, one thing I, I learned and started to appreciate pretty early in my journey was that eyepieces are, I would say they're as important as the telescope itself. They're, they're half of the telescope. They, they play a critical role in terms of the quality of the views you're going to get, the magnification levels, and they can change the fields of view. Um, I know for me, with such a, a long focal ratio scope, one of the first things I wanted to do was figure out, is there any way I can make a, you know, how how would I maximize the field of view for 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 the eyepiece that I that I, that I would get? And did some research on that, uh, talked to a few people and um, figured out what would be um, the, the sort of the best uh, eyepiece for that. The challenge, of course, with it, it was a teleview, what's known as a as a as a pan optic um, 24. Um, and, you know, I came to realize very quickly, it's quite expensive, but I had to make the decision do I start investing in things that are going to be strategic investments where if I buy an expensive eyepiece for a really kind of cheap scope, it seems counterintuitive, but I knew for down the road, if I got an expensive eyepiece, that's something I could use for different scopes as I acquire them in later years. So kind of had to make that, that decision. Um, so you need to know uh, the size of eyepiece that your scope uses, whether it's like what's known as one and a quarter, which is probably, I would say the most common maybe. Um, but then as you start getting into larger scopes um, and more elaborate systems, uh, they typically have what's known as a two inch focuser, which, um, you know, which, which accommodates like a two inch eyepiece and it's when you start getting into that area that you can really start maximizing your field of view. And they're, they're actually, they can be really fun to use. So I, eyepieces, they range um, from what's known as very low power. So I, I guess kind of counterintuitively, the higher the number, the lower the power. So something like a fit, what's like a 55 millimeter eyepiece is actually very low magnification, but it has, Again, the flip of that, it's got a very, very wide field of view. And uh, you go to things like a three millimeter with very high magnification power, your your field of view is going to be like tiny, 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 tiny. Um, so yeah, so I think with that, it's just, again, kind of knowing, knowing what it is that you want to look at and getting the kind of equipment between the scope and the eyepieces that are going to enable you to... Uh, 
to look at um, what you want to observe. So for me, um, it, you know, I happened like there's there's tons of different types of entry level scopes. Uh, you know, for me, like a a ninety millimeter Mat CAS was just kind of a you know an a scope of opportunity. Um, but there there's tons of other options. Um, you know, whether it's you know like I think it's fair to say that the I think the six inch reflector on a Dobsonian mount is really kind of the generally recommended starter scope uh, for, you know, given it's got like six inches of aperture, it's on a really stable mount, it's, you know, a fairly straightforward um, device to use. So there's that, there's small refractors, there's, 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 there's lots of entry points into, into scopes. Um, I, I found for me, um, you know, having a small telescope was great for doing the Explore the Moon with a small telescope program. I really found that program, that was the thing that really kind of taught me how to use the scope, you know, comfortably, um, as well as uh, finding double stars. I just, uh, I just found a small scope was just fabulous for that. Um, so really enjoyed the um, Explore the Moon and Explore the Universe program. So for me, my next kind of phase in my own journey was figuring out, okay, well, if I want to do the intermediate um, observing programs, like there's there's the double star program, there's the Messier program, and the Isabel Williamson lunar observing program, what types of scopes would I want to invest in that would enable me to do these programs? So that was, but that's a that's a me thing. Uh, many, many other people probably have no, you know, doing a structured observing program may not necessarily sound like the funnest thing to do, um, which totally under, I understand. Um, so it's just remembering, figuring out what type of scope is the one you're going to actually use that you're able to transport, that you're e able to lift, that you're comfortable, that you're going to have fun with. And uh and and figuring that out, there's so many options and choices, which is which is really great. Um, other considerations I I had uh, along my way was making a personal decision with my observing. Um, is did I want to do the kind of traditional star hopping method with maps, or did I want to use a computerized aid, essentially like a go to mount or or that kind of system and. RASC offers certificates um, for for either approach. Um, they just specify which one you've used. So that's something I, I know for me, I I just the big joy for me uh, is learning, um, you know, learning the sky and kind of finding things the hard way. It, it can be time consuming. And, you know, I've spent, you know, I can spend like an hour or longer looking for like one little object, right? But but it's it's just very rewarding when you find it. Um, so that's but there's different options, um, types of mounts like there. So especially if you're interested in like go tos and stuff like that, like having a really stable mount is just so it's 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 very important. Um, type of finder scope or finder eyepiece. There's just lots of options there. But again, um, not to overwhelm folks but it's just just being aware that there's there's lots of things to make a decision about but it's just all part of that um kind of learning journey for sure that's um i'm i'm just finding it very interesting to to learn about all these different things so key takeaways is um figuring out what you personally want to find and observe what you what you want to get out of your equipment um, you know, like if it's, if it's deep sky, then, you know, I would, you know, suggest like finding the biggest kind of reflector that you, that you can manage, right? I mean, that's practical and realistic that we, you would actually use. Um, if it's the moon or the planets or other things, then probably a different type of, uh, you know, optic would be, would be better. Um, so while aperture is key, source portability and ease of use, 
um, the importance of focal length and focal ratio and what these mean for possible magnifications and fields of view for different types of scopes. Um, the importance of decent eyepieces, remembering that they're half the scope and kind of saving the not the best for last, but you know, the importance of a good mount, like it just cannot be, I think, overstated. Like, you know, the scope is important, but if it's on a crappy mount, um, the level of frustration is probably going to get so high that it, it could actually deter somebody from continuing in the hobby. And last thing is just uh, just in summary, um, there's some great resources out there to start with. Um, you know, RASC has a fabulous guidebook for the Explore the Universe program that's got uh, got tons of detailed information in it. Um, the Observer's Handbook, uh, my one of my personal favorites, Night Watch by Terence Dickinson and Ken Hewitt White. Um, I love that book, and pretty much almost anything, even now that I've, I've got a question about. Even if it's only like one line, you know, it's a start. And, and typically there'll be something in that book about it. Um, the Backyard Astronomer's Guide. And um, I I personally find things like Sky Savarians to Stellarium just, you know, invaluable. Like they're really great things to have. Um, yeah. So I think that's, that is the end of my presentation. Does anyone have any questions for Kirsten or comments? Okay, Kirsten, I know you went and bought another one after wow. your 90 millimeter matchy top. What made you decide to uh, invest in a second one? Yeah, I, I just, I, well, I figured out, um, you know, that for me, I wanted to proceed into the, uh, the intermediate observing programs. So um, the Isabel Williamson uh, learning uh, lunar observing program, uh, the uh, double star program, and the Messier program and Rask National, their website has all the details on these programs, like in terms of uh, what they recommend for equipment and um, and then the content of the programs themselves. And, and so I, I looked at their recommendations and for me, uh, what, I, what I chose, and it may not be the right recommendation for, for somebody else, um, even with the same goals, but uh, uh, for me, considering, you know, my own, I, I don't know if I'd say personal limitations, but, you know, knowing myself enough to know kind of the maximum that I'm prepared to carry. Um, I've got stairs in my place. Um, you know, I, what I want to sort of have in terms of portability. So I had to make a decision then about, okay, what, what's going to give me the best kind of views of the moon. So for, you know, while still being like, say a smaller scope than like an eight inch Dobsonian because that's just, well, it's a great unit and a great rig. It's just, it's too big for me, right? I, I just know that I'll be deterred kind of by this, the size and the weight, right? So um, even, even a six inch is, is, is just, a, it's just a little bit on the heavy and the bulky side. So trying to find, okay, well, what would be, what would be, um, um, good substitutions like so what would enable me to see the see the moon well so i went with um i i upgraded to um a five inch um uh mac uh so i've, I've got like a a 127 uh millimeter um aperture uh mac that um that came for with a you know you have to kind of look at the the budget and and the price and all that kind of stuff, but it happened to come with the the type of mount I wanted. So for for not that much extra money, so I figured with the mount um, and then getting a five inch uh, Mac will really enable me to have some fabulous views in the moon, big and 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 double stars as well. I mean, it's just kind of kind of what I what I have already, but 
big, just, you know, <laughs> that, that temptation of getting bigger and better, right. Um, without getting, without going to, to overboard the, the, the scope for, um, the deep sky objects, the messiers was a little bit harder for me, but I decided to go with, um, a very, um, I would I would call it uh, kind of a a short focal length. So it's 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 what's known as a short tube uh, refractor. So it's short focal length. My my uh, I've got a one hundred and twenty millimeter uh, refractor uh, that I that I that I purchased. Um, it's 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 a straightforward acromat. Like it's it doesn't have a lot of you know fancy glass in it and you know high end glass. It's pretty much a, a beginner's instrument for sure. Uh, but it's got a big aperture to try to collect as much light um, in a reasonable size for a refractor without without um, without getting too, too big and too heavy. And um, and then having that kind of sort of wide field of view, like with the short tube refractor, it's got um, with that kind of short focal length, kind of going back to that focal length again, um, it, it has a uh, low magnification, but very wide field of view. Now, depending on the eyepiece, however, you know, you can get the magnification up pretty good, but that's why I now have two different tools. I've got like that five inch Mac that's going to be like a high magnification, long focal, focal length scope that's going to enable me to look at things like the moon, planets and, and stars in deep detail but then i've got like a low power low magnification wide field of view short tube refractor that's just going to enable me to sweep around and look for stuff and and find find the deeper sky objects so that that was my reasoning that was my reasoning behind it thank you any other questions or comments for kirsten yeah kirsten that, that was really nice, very nice talk. And uh, I, I, I was glad to hear you go back to what I already knew is that you wanted to learn the sky and star hop. I got worried when, when you first mentioned go-to scopes is, but um, and being portable. But uh, in terms of finding things, I don't know if people can see this, the sky atlas. This is whether binoculars, whatever kind of scope, if you just want to learn the sky and go around like wine, rambling through the uh, local woods that you don't know very well, you look at it, you it has quite bright objects, SPA, NGC, very good index. And then star hopping to you find other things that are within view of whatever scope you have and i've certainly had more fun finding things that i then had to come back and use another other programs to find out what they were but i had my sketches from the 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 object that was in this book i knew where it was and i went wherever whatever directions so just adding for I think I know some of you, maybe many of you out there already know this and use it, but if you don't, it's I it's very portable. And as you may see, this one is falling apart. <laughs> Thank you, Dorothy. Shonik? Yes, I had two questions, uh, Kristen. Um, first, you know, and <laughs> please don't tell me I made the a mistake, I made the wrong decision, but I decided to get really, because I live at Culver Point, I want to go out um, to the ocean. And so I decided to get quite high-end, good quality binoculars that are recommended. I didn't go with the Canon were sometimes recommended number one, but for much more money. And they have that shaking resistant technology. But I thought, well, if I can get a tripod because it takes a tripod, these binoculars. I thought it might do the job in the short term. They have fair, very high magnification for binoculars, 25 times. Um, so uh, I guess I want you to say, oh, that's a good decision, but it was clearly portability, right? Um, that's the first question. I'll just add the second because it's related. 
I don't, I'm too new to know what you mean by mount. So are you talking about the tripod? Because I would like you to say something about that, how you make decisions about that, because that I haven't committed to. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, and uh, and others may others may want to weigh in on this too. I'm I by no means am. There's much more knowledgeable people on this call than I am, but I I I would I would say that you know there's no you absolutely did not make a bad decision or anything like that. I think knowing yourself, like knowing your your you know what portability and you know ease of use and having really great binoculars uh, 25 times on a, a sturdy mount and a tripod that's an awesome setup that's 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 going to be a fabulous uh way to you know get to know the sky and you know without without having to get into you know you, you're kind of it's brilliant actually you're sidestepping and avoiding a lot of the you know kind of the you know some of the the complexities perhaps that go along with um with learning learning the telescope. So I think, no, I think it's a, it's a great decision. I, I think, um, you know, what you will, you know, and, and I, you know, who knows, everybody's different. I think what you will find as time goes on is as you get to know the sky and learn more things and you, and you, and you, you sort of get to your 25 times, you'll then be kind of like, well, I wonder what that'll look like at like a hundred times <laughs> or, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, especially with some of the, the, the brighter objects, um, you know, you know, that, that's just kind of what I found. I fell into the kind of probably the, the, the typical trap where, you know, you, once you start to learn things and see things and the beauty of it, you just want to see more, right? But 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 absolutely, there's you just can't go wrong with that. And the tripod. Yeah. Um, is that what a mount means? No, a, a mount is it's it sort sort of does and it sort of doesn't. Um, and Dave, David might want to speak, or David or Brock might want to speak mm -hmm. more to this. But uh, I think you know, in in a, in a, the world of a telescope, there's kind of what's known as like the mount head, which is the piece of um, of, of the setup that actually like holds the scope. Like there's gonna be like a kind of a bracket in there that, you know, d depending on the type of it, there's different names for it, but it basically it holds the scope. And then that mount head um, is, it sits on the tripod for stability. And de depending on the type of mount, um, you know, in terms of whether it's a go-to or an alt-as or an equatorial, that mount head will look and do different things depending on the type of of setup but fundamentally um you know as, as if it's you, again that's kind of another whole thing to learn but mm. for the purposes of binoculars you don't really need to worry about any of that for right now yeah, you've got, yeah you've, so you've... so basically the the mount i think that you're referring to is uh and that's really a good uh explanation kirsten the um, a mount, a telescope mount. Okay, let's let's talk. Telescope mount uh, is actually composed of uh, at least two pieces. Uh, one is the legs, which we traditionally call a tripod, but the mount portion is the thing that facilitates the movement or the tracking of a telescope according to two types of coordinate systems. Um, th this is something you you probably will learn. Um, the alt azimuth coordinate system basically has to do with cardinal direction and altitude, right, from horizon. So that is probably the simplest coordinate system that we learn. But if you want to do kind of photography and you want to do tracking, there's something called an equatorial mount, and its head is different because it actually has two axes associated with it, one for declination and one for RA. RA is the one to, to think about because RA is the arc in which stars follow, like, like the, the celestial objects follow. So basically, if you were to align the mount, so to speak, to the pole star or to Polaris, then moving that mount will allow you to track whatever you point at, right? So the mount is there to facilitate that. Uh, the extra thing that goes beyond that is automation. So then you can have you know, uh, computer type uh, databases attached to it that will point exactly to it. But that 
that's just beyond the physical characteristics of the mount that allow you to facilitate the tracking in those two coordinate systems. Hopefully that's a good explanation. I don't, I'm not quite sure, but. Uh... Yeah, and it's not not something, Sean, that, that you will need with binoculars. Exactly, exactly, yeah. But I, you know, you you would still use the the alt as coordinate system in a sense, because if you were to look at a map, you would say, "Oh, this is in the yeah. east. Uh, oh, this is about thirty degrees up." So you kind of would use that system to uh, to sort of find your orientation, right? But that's you, not necessarily a mount doing that. So you could be holding your binos, or you could have your binos on a tripod and point using that kind of system. Just one question, David. Is there any consideration for the tripods that you would recommend? What tripod you would purchase? Uh, the sturdiest and most rigid you can. Now, that, that that's a bit of an oxymoron because um, uh, really rigid and solid typically means heavy. Uh, that isn't necessarily true because of there's uh, technological advancements like carbon fiber, which allow us to have our cake and eat it too. So you can have light and rigid. Uh, I think Brock probably knows even more super exotic uh, materials, but uh, uh, that type of technology, which comes with a cost, uh, monetary wise, uh, but yeah, that that would allow you to do that. Uh, for instance, I have a tripod that weighs five pounds, which is extraordinarily light for a telescopic uh, mount tripod. Uh, but then I've got much heavier ones too, like 30 pounds. So again, this kind of... Uh, kind of speaks to the portability aspect that Kirsten talked about. So yeah, I mean, for you, if you, if you've got binos, uh, I don't know what kind of tripod you bought for your, your binos, but uh, anything that you can carry around is, is perfectly suitable. Uh, if, if you want to one up that and you've got the cash, then you can go carbon fiber for that, even if you wanted to, right. That isn't necessarily telescopic, but super light. Yeah. Thank you. I would just want, I just wanted to add to uh, Dorothy's comment. I had my hand up. Um, I, the, the comment about um, uh, references, like map references, I know Kirsten talked a lot about Stellarium and Sky Safari, which I love, but I would like to maybe flip sides and, and join Dorothy in the sense that the paper atlases are kind of interesting in the fact that they short circuit the uh, ultimate flexibility of a digital resource. And what I mean by that is uh, in a digital resource, you can you can choose how many stars you want to see, what sort of things you want to see. But a sky atlas is kind of a fixed entity, which I, I kind of appreciate when you don't have a periphery of choices. Sometimes that's actually better, actually. So a lot of the paper atlases were designed for uh, vis visible eye usage. So in other words, uh, there's atlases like the Bright Star, Bright Star Sky Atlas, which only has stars that you can visually see in, 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 in the sky, right? That's very useful. Now, I'll, I'll tell you, you go to a dark sky site for the first time, it is overwhelming. You see way too many stars and you can't tell what you're looking at. Sometimes suburbia is your friend because you can only just see the bright stars and then you can make out the pieces. So starting off in an urban environment is not a curse. Uh, it actually will help you in the beginning. And then when you're ready for it, you can go to darker uh, sites. But anyways, uh, uh, um, uh, a plus or, or a mark for the paper atlases because they, they are well-defined and then you can sort of browse them and flip through them uh, unlike a digital resource. Though I love digital resources, don't get me wrong, but paper ones are really good too. Thank you. Oh. Hey. Paper uh, ones use your the better computer. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. <laughs> oh, for sure. Moving up and down quickly, smoothly, and scale and brightness. Yes. Randy, do you have something yeah, to add? Um, I'd like to say to Sean, I, the issue with binoculars is you kind of crash into your tripod because you're too close to it. So there is the frugal solution, which is what I did, where you just take a, um, what do you call it? A, 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 like a shelf bracket, 
you you uh, take a you know a piece of bent metal that pulls your binoculars far back from the um, where it attaches to the uh, tripod so that you don't bump into the leg all the time. But you can also get a really spiffy thing that kind of pulls you quite far from your tripod. And, and what I would really love, Joe Carr, you gave a talk to Astro Cafe, I think long enough ago that we've had a turnover of most of the people here. And if you were to offer your binocular talk again, I think many of us would love it because I know I know a lot more now than when you first gave that talk to me. And so if you'd be willing to do that one again, um, I think there, the crowd here would be appreciative. You certainly are talking about ancient history, but I can give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to make a couple of comments. I mean, I've been doing amateur astronomy for a very long time and I have three telescopes, but I still use a pair of binoculars. Uh, one of the problems with, with high carb binoculars is they're generally heavy and the power is a little too high to handle. If you find yourself there and you want a real quick solution, get yourself a lawn chair. Sit down in the lawn chair, brace your elbows on the arms of the lawn chair, and that stops the shaking. That's the first thing to do. If you really want a sophisticated mount for binoculars, you can get a thing called a parallelogram mount That's it. that walks on, mounts on a tripod and has a pair of arms that go to the side that holds your, your binoculars, and you can move it all around the sky and it will support them without you actually having to hand hold them. Keep seeing. Thank don't give up on your binos. They'll, you'll find them useful all the time. Great. Well, and I haven't bought a tripod yet, so parallelogram. No, parallel. Is that right? A parallelogram mount, they're called. But Yeah, a a actually, I'm just going to bring one up on the screen, and you can yeah. see what it looks like. So here, here's an example of one. Uh, there are others as well. Um, but you can see there, there's a, there is a tripod. And then this is probably not a good example. Let me just find a better example here, just a sec. The one the site I used to go to was a, a site called bigbinoculars.com. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if it's still in the process. <laughs> I'm a little older. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So there's a bunch here. Uh, this is just on a Google search. Um, this is probably more of a traditional, some of these are more of a traditional kind of uh, parallelogram. Now let's come back to the same spot, just that. Mount Fuji, giant. Yeah, that kind. Yeah, yeah. big ones. Yeah, more like this or um, uh, more like, like this style. Yeah, like that. Uh, th basically what it is, uh, there's a parallelogram and then there's a weight, so to counteract the the weight of having the binocular off to one side. Um, again, I'm not sure if these are great examples. Probably should wait for uh, Joe's talk because uh, he probably has much better examples. And uh, Joe, you you still have a parallelogram, right? Do you, Joe? I don't know. Joe's still there. Uh, no, personally, I won't use the parallelogram. Oh, okay. <laughs> sort of, sort of defeats the purpose. I just, I just went with image stabilized binoculars and the zero yeah, G lounge they, chair. That's much better. They definitely <laughs> can be. They definitely can be fussy. But uh, you, you know, I, I, I definitely agree with Dave. Lawn chair is actually the best. You know, like yeah. a, if you're lying back and you got your elbows back like this. Uh, I mean, this is the common stance, right? Because at that point, you become the tripod, right? And and then you can move around at, at will, but yeah, there there are these kind of fancy parallelogram devices. Um, there is uh, a type of lawn chair called a zero gravity lawn chair. That's yeah, lawn we have those up at the VCO as as well. Much more comfortably. Yeah, just just Google uh, bino parallelogram. You'll see the same page that I have here. Um, <laughs> even people here, you have people lying down again, and they just have supports that swing over. 
uh, again, I mean, you live down by the water. I'm assuming you're going to walk down to where you want to view. So you won't want to carry a lot of stuff with you either, right? But uh, yeah, there's different choices. Um, stabilization is um, most people's answer nowadays, but uh, um, this is this is a cheaper alternative. And probably the cheapest alternative is the lawn chair, or the zero gravity chair. Good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, when you say stabilization, you mean that Canon? Yeah, there's there's a number of them. I think the main system is uh, the Canon IS. Uh, they they come, I think, twelve by eighty, twelve. They have different sizes, uh, but yeah, they have internal stabilization. It's very similar to the stabilization they use in cameras. Yeah, they're expensive, but they work very very well. They're in the twelve to eighteen hundred dollar range. Yeah, I opted to get something about half that price with the idea I'd get a tripod. Yeah, that's still okay. Still like all right. Celestron or something. It was I, I use I use a good uh, Matroto tripod with a, a three-axis head on it for my binoculars for 90% of the stuff I do with mm -hmm. mine. But then they, mine, they, mine are 10 power. They're, they, they're a little yeah. more forgiving. Yeah, depending on the size of your bino, um, uh, I, Dave is right. Manfrotto is great. There, there's two main legs that I always consider being a photographer. They're, they're French and, uh, there are French and Italian legs, but they're, they're actually the same co company now. So it's Gitzo and Manfrotto. So, uh, the Manfrotto is the more uh, economical section of the uh, series. Uh, but they're very, very good tripods and uh, you can get them used quite, uh, quite commonly, but, Manfrotto also makes a joystick. I don't know if I can find a picture of one, but you kind of grip it in your hand. And when you when you squeeze it, it becomes totally maneuverable. When you let go, it stops. So that might be an option as well, as long as your binoculars aren't super huge. Jonic, I have a I have I use binoculars, so 10 by 42. And I did the Explore the Moon and Explore the Universe with my uh, binoculars. Um, with uh, the Explore the Moon, I did it on my balcony with my tripod. Um, and I have not, I have not taken the tripod outside. I didn't need it for Explore the Explore the Universe uh, at Cattle Point. I found it was just as easy to hold my binoculars. But um, I bought it. Brenda, Brenda suggested the tripod, and uh, it was sixty dollars at Canadian Tire. So if you feel as if you want, I'm not using my tripod at the moment. So if you feel you as if you'd like to borrow it and try it out with your binoculars, you're welcome to do so. Thank you. That's a very generous offer. I'll explore all this and see. Oh yeah, I for sure. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Kirsten, very much. I always, it's generated lots of discussion. And I, I, I find that your presentation is um, very, very clear for me. And having heard it now a second time, I understood things the second time, uh, even better than I understood things the first time. So thank you very much. Randy, you would like to talk about the kids to kids scope. I do. So let me share my screen. And I'll go F5. And we'll try that again. F5. There we go. So um just credits are uh, on Saturday I went to Dave Robinson's house and he showed me how to use the thing and while it was still fresh in my mind Saturday night up uh, outside the Plaska Dome I set it up and David Lee photo documented it as I did it and so uh, what I'm particularly pleased about is with this recording we'll be able to tell anybody who is going to set up this wonderful telescope, um, it's now documented. So, so we'll be able to just point to this. Uh, so starts off, look at that, July 2023. So over a year ago, 
Uh, Edmonton Rask was trying to figure out what to do with this telescope. They made five of them and uh, it wasn't getting used. And so they wanted to, to donate it to us. And that's all very well, but um, I, I love this at the bottom. It says uh, that, um, where does it say it? That, that uh, Alistair would take it down as checked baggage. Well, no, I don't think I don't think uh, you would be able to get it on an airplane without paying a lot of money because it is not light. It's made by Roman Roman eunuch eunuch, and Dave likes to say that his motto is more steel. <laughs> anyway, if you look up kids scope on the internet, you'll find the April two thousand and three newsletter of the uh, Edmonton Center. And there we have, right. I have no idea, it looked pretty much the same. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 21 years ago, that's what Dave looked like with this remarkable telescope. They made five of them and it comes in these two boxes. And in the smaller box, I, uh, the main thing that's in there is, well, it's got the uh, the clockwork or the, 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 drive, yeah. the drive, and it's got the battery that is going to run it. And uh, it's set up so you can place it in there on a nice little foam pad so that it's protected when you're going to screw in the legs on those three, um, sockets for 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 threaded uh for threaded pipe and there it is in all its glory there's a lot of steel it's heavy it takes two people to move that box it, it's a fork mounted telescope it's a a six inch f5 so it has a 30 inch focal length it's a standard newtonian so uh you pull out the first leg and screw it in What's clever, well, among many, many clever things is the, um, there's one leg, uh, which is a smaller diameter and it fits in the bigger one. And that smaller leg is going to be pointing south. That is your south uh, pillar. And then the other two are, you know, at right angles to it. So there I'm putting in the second leg and there I'm putting in the third leg. Okay, so it's upside down. Then what you're going to do is put, my hand is on the thinner one and you're going to put it facing or pointing towards the south. So there you are, it's, you know, extremely rough right now, then you have to orient it. And uh, a point that you have to make is it was designed for Edmonton. So 53 degrees latitude, we're at 48 and a half. And so um, it comes with a very handy dandy uh, little wedge there uh, to, to make the south pillar a bit higher, but outside the plastic dome, that, uh, that the, um, concrete's not the concrete is far from flat and it would actually pointed even steeper. So I ended up putting the glass leg on the concrete under the rail to, to raise up that, that leg a bit. Yeah, on a perfectly flat space, that yellow wedge underneath would, would do it. And you, you point it so that the shaft, which is the little steel thing that is right under Randy's elbow, you point that at Polaris. This thing. Yeah, that's going to be pointing towards the North Pole. So how do I orient it? I got out sun calc and looked towards where the sun was. And, you know, so I put the dot here towards the sun and then I knew where north was. Okay, so that's how I oriented it. And then there's this um, special nut, specially machined for this. We must not lose that. 
and it lives under this Velcro. And then it also has this uh, little socket that you're going to screw it in with. So that is kind of the, the a critical little piece that we mustn't lose. So then you fold up the forks and it's got two handles. You also see there's the tell red here for, for um, star finding. We were just using it for the moon, so I didn't use this, but you know that potentially could be useful if you're looking for something more difficult. Anyway, you lift it up by those handles and you put it, you, there, there's a, um, a hole, a, shaft, a place for the shaft right up here. And it's upside down right now. That Not plastic there, that is the cell for the mirror. That's what's holding up the mirror, okay? So it's upside down right now. It goes in, that's where the nut goes, and you don't have to tighten it very hard. It's just to stop it from falling off. Yeah, the two surfaces are machined, so that they uh, made up really nice. It was very simple. The only problem is this bloody heavy. How much? I mean, I could lift it up. I could lift it up, but it's... 25 pounds, maybe, the forks are just gold. It has... Um, the, the electrical connection is actually pretty heavy duty, but it doesn't fall out. So that, that was a clever idea. And then you see just by my hand, this picture is better than the next one I see. That's the on off switch right there. So there you go that you turn it on and um, you can see in here, there's a, there's a threaded rod and it, moves that's what moves the uh telescope along and if you after what you said 90 minutes I mean, about, about a little less than two hours anyway we didn't if we didn't runs. get to the end during uh saturday evening but if it does it resets itself when you turn this off and back on then there's a a, a way that it sets itself back so i uh, it's very simple it's beautifully simple. <laughs> it's simple to use, but you have to remember that Roman was a, is a professional engineer who spent many years managing the control systems for buildings for the province of Alberta. Okay, and he he wired it all up and designed all the electronics for it. So you take off the lens cap, and I, uh, the smart thing is to put that on the box with the battery right under the tripod. So that's what, uh, you know, you put it here and then you don't lose it. That's important. And the cord's only so long. Yeah, that's a good picture. Uh, it does not come with eyepieces, but in the center of the universe, uh, there's a whole cabinet with a bunch of eyepieces. I used a 13 millimeter uh, Celestron, what was it called? I forget. And I, uh, it was very nice for seeing the moon. You could see the whole moon with that, that field of view. And then at the end of the evening, uh, we put it in the storeroom in the center of the universe. I think that's the right place. Is that correct, Laurie? Is that where you're planning to keep it? You're muted. <laughs> Still muted. <laughs> there we go. Sorry. Um, uh, I've never seen this before, so I have no idea, and we'll have to find a spot for it. Okay, anyway, it's with a bunch of other telescopes up right now. That, that's our Coronado, the, um, the solar telescope right beside it. Anyway, that, that might be where it lives. And what were we there for? This is the segue. So that, that's, that's it. If there's a question about the kid scope, um, Oh, I have to say another thing is there's some engineering here, which I think is remarkable, but you can just move it by hand. There's, they, they, they're, it, it's easy to spin it around anywhere you want in the sky, and then it just stays. So the, there's some magic going on in there, but um, I was... Uh, in control of this and 
my uh, 90 millimeter Maxitov, just like what uh, Kirsten was talking about, which I had to keep tracking as people were, were uh, using it. Every couple of people, I had to go back to the other one to fix it up. And I kept checking this one because I thought somebody was going to knock it. And for the whole time that people were looking at the moon, it tracked perfectly without a problem. But it's just that you just move it by hand to where you want it, and then it stays there. So there's some magic that went on. Well-designed clutches. <laughs> okay, so uh, what were we doing? It was International Observe the Moon Night. Uh, why? I don't know. Oh, there's a question from Dorothy. Oh, uh, could you just, uh, I may have missed it, explain the name of the scope? Kids ah. scope? Well, that it was a program that we called Kids Scope. That the pro we built five of these primarily for school out outreach program in Edmonton, and the idea was to build a moderate size telescope that would be able to be used by elementary school kids with minimal supervision, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't be able to damage it or hurt themselves playing with it. And it worked very well for quite a few years until it became more difficult for schools to get teachers to go out at night with their students. Oh, yeah. We used it up at the observatory in Edmonton quite a bit. We had one there for quite a while. Great. But we, we had we had five of them, uh, four are, are, are six inch and one was an eight inch. They just couldn't have, they, they had a fire in their storage facility and they had to move all their stuff out and, uh, or in the building that held their storage facility. And they just didn't have room to store them anymore. Okay. So, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday this week, up at the observatory, Vox Humana is a wonderful 24-part choir, um, voice choir. And they were spectacular. And I gather they do a similar concert each year. Uh, I went on Friday night, uh, and they even used the sound of the dome. There's one piece that they played, and it kind of started all ethereal, and then all of a sudden you started hearing Greek roll. And, 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 the, and the, the thing about being inside the dome is it covers all your peripheral vision, so you feel like you're moving yourself while it's moving around. It was spectacular. Anyway, I went Friday night, Observe the Moon Night was Saturday, and David and I set up three telescopes. Uh, here, look at that. David, I have to say, it was, it was his eye. He said, look how beautiful that is. So the sun was setting, and it just did that beautiful projection of the shadow onto the dome while people were getting ready, lining up to go inside. I, that picture makes me really happy. Uh, and this was from Friday night, but this is what it looked like inside. And uh, again, super, go next year. They totally sold out. You have to buy your tickets early. Uh, I can't say enough good about that concert. I, I loved it. Uh, this is what it looked like outside. We had a beautiful sunset and the moon came out, yay. <laughs> Except during the concert, I thought we'd have lots of time and I could do a sketch but it spent most of the time behind clouds. Very fortunately, the um, sky opened up just after the last piece. And uh, so um, there's David. And this is my little Mac that I kept moving along. And here's the kids scope. And we figure we had, you know, there were a hundred people plus the choir. So 125 people or so there. And I would say at least half of them took a look. So it was, I think, a very successful outreach event. And uh, and it was fun. What more can you say? Hmm. Uh, what were we looking at? It was a uh, waxing gibbous moon. Um, 
for some reason, when you looked at the telescope, it didn't give you these words all over it, but who knows? <laughs> Mine did. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't give us the AI uh, enhanced uh, version. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, one thing that I particularly found interesting was uh, there was this big bite out at the Terminator. Um, it's uh, Schickard. Uh, Crater, and that, that was something. And what we could see as we went through the evening is seeing the light hit the inside of this uh, crater. And had it not got cloudy, I think I might have done a sketch when I got back home, but uh, there was just that little window. And I think that's all I have to say. Do you want to say more about it, David? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm going to roll the clock back a little bit. Uh, you showed... Uh when it actually got dark and and you're very right on saturday night we were dodging clouds but uh i got the opportunity to um uh try my little uh, weekend trick uh, this summer uh looking for venus so this time i th this is not very high fi this is very low fi photography but uh, i'll just give you a look here so during the time when the sun set and we were waiting, I kept looking for um, uh, Venus. And eventually I did find it. And I decided to do something very lo-fi. I just used my phone. So there is Venus. Uh, it was actually a beautiful sky. Uh, for those of you who are uh, pure photographers, I have to tell you that there is some generative AI here because I needed to clean up the edges. Uh, there's no generative AI in here, but the edges are generative AI just to clean clean up the edges. But yeah, it was an amazing sky. I, I, I have to say that uh, the picture doesn't do justice to the color. Uh, it was a, a brilliant orange. And uh, Venus definitely appeared like a disc. So it was uh, that that was one of, one of my highlights before we, we started on our uh, journey of looking for the moon. And I did return on Sunday uh, for the Sunday performance, which was absolutely amazing. Uh, it was even clearer. Or actually, it was clear. And after the performance, uh, I, I came out, certainly not as many people as uh, the night that Randy and I were there, but... Uh, there were a number of people that came by and looked through the scope. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, David. All right, Lori, you are up next. We and can't hear. To, we can't hear, muted. Lori. You're muted, my I'm dear. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Okay. Um, so I'm going to just see. Um, so we're just going to do this and oops, here we go. Okay. So I've just got a little um, bit of some stuff on ordering your publications for 2025. Um, uh, I feel as though I just finished doing 2024, but you know, it now is now is ready to go. Um, so there's a number of things that are going to be available this year. There's the RESC 2025 calendar. Um, and um, online, it's $22.95. If we order 35 or 40 of them, it'll be into the $18 to $20 range. I won't know until we actually get the uh, get the quote from the RASC and I find out what the what the um what the uh, cost will be for um uh um, for postage so it'll but it'll be probably within that range so that's the RESC calendar um we also have the night sky almanac uh which is Nicole Mortaleros you may actually notice Mar Nicole Mortalero is on CBC radio and CBC television um uh but she also does the uh, night sky almanac and it's uh it'll be somewhere between 16 and 17 dollars um to get that one um, we also have, uh, as um, um, Kirsten was talking about, is the Explore the Universe Guide, 
which is the third, uh, which is the third edition. If you are a fairly new member, uh, so within the last say year and a little bit, you will have received the Explore the Universe guide um, um, as as part of your as part of the package that you received at the beginning. Um, if you if you are an older member and don't have this little book. Um, it's about $17 to, to get the book itself. And then there's the Explore the, um, the Universe guidebook, uh, which has um, all the information that you need, plus where to put it. So they've got all the pictures or the pages inside uh, that you can use if you wish in order to do the um to to make the to make the drawings and have all the information some people use it and some people don't so it just depends on on how on 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 what you like to unlike what you like to use but that is available and then there's also uh just what Kirsten was talking about as well is explore the moon with binoculars and also the explore the moon with a small telescope workbook so those are also available for ten dollars each and uh, so if you're not if you're thinking about doing the program, they are really a good a good thing to certainly look at um, if you'd like them. Um, and then another thing that is available is the 50 things to see with a telescope activity workbook. This is from John Reed, who is from Nova Scotia. And um, the book, the book itself, I, I don't believe that the RASC actually um actually um has the book in its um in its e-store but they do have this activity workbook so if you get the um if you uh, all the information is all there just not the really detailed stuff from the from the information is there but all those are ten dollars a piece and um so what you need to do is to email email me at that address roche.laurie at gmail.com or i put two Phone, uh, phone numbers there if you would like to call me and leave messages um i do need your your full name please um if you just say dave it's going to be a problem because we have lots of dates um so i need your full name uh contact information it would be really nice to have both a phone number and an email just so that we could have that the number the titles that you would like and the numbers per title that you want um, and then, and I would like the order before October the 21st. If I put everything in on October the 21st, we should be able to get most of this by the November, by the November um, meeting where we meet at UVic. And, um, and I would be able to actually hand them physically out to you. Otherwise, you know, we have to get them at certain places or, <laughs> or, you know, have people wandering around the city trying to, to get you all the different things. Anyway, that's fine. That's kind of part of the deal that I do this for. But, uh, but it's the more that we can get um, in the same place at the same time, that would be really great. So I'll just take any, any questions or anything that anybody has that you would like to ask. I have a question, Laurie. It's Shauna. Yes. <laughs> yes. I just joined and I didn't receive anything in the mail. I joined about a month ago. <laughs> oh, it may take it. You you will get something. It may take a little bit longer than the month to get it all out. I mean, even I mean, it's, it sometimes takes three weeks to get anything mailed. So I, I did wait. <laughs> I did order some books and I didn't. Okay. I didn't receive them. Um, All right. I will. Um, you can if you want to uh, just uh, email me and we can kind of look look that up and see what's see what's going on. Yeah, that would be great. OK, I will um, stop sharing and um, go from there. And then the other thing that I have and I'm hoping I can hoping I can do this again is um, to um share the screen no it is not up there shoot okay um um i have a um the information about the uh um program that is going to be this coming thursday it's um canada in space and it is a um three three different people that are going to be speaking um uh randy atwood from toronto is going to be here. Um, Bob McDonald from Quirks and Quarks and our very own Chris Gaynor is going to be are going to be speaking and telling stories about 
um, different aspects of, of space. Um, uh, some of our early astronomers, Randy Atwood is going to be talking to us about uh, Mark Garneau's, the first mission with a Canadian astronaut, Mark Garneau's mission. Um, Bob is going to talk to us about some of the spacewalkers that we've had. And then um, Chris is going to talk about the Canadarm. And um, he's going to actually talk a little bit about how the Canadarm I mean, has come through history, but also what it will what it will do uh, for the Lunar Gateway. So he's going to be kind of going past, present, and future for that. Um, we invite people up at six forty five um, to the center of the universe, where the gate will open. Then, and we have refreshments um, for everybody. And uh, then the presentations will be seven thirty to eight thirty, with probably fifteen or so minutes of of um, discussion and everything at the end. And then uh, uh, we'll. If it's gorgeous, then we can maybe put a couple of telescopes up if people would like to have telescopes up to have a look at at the end. Um, and then we'll be finished by about nine o'clock. So it's a fairly um, early early evening, but I think will be a really good one. The tickets are $10 um, a piece, and that is paying for things like our commissionaires and some of the refreshments and everything. We're not making, uh, this is not a money making, uh, I'm not making for either the RASC or the FDAO. We're just simply covering our costs. And um, and the tickets uh, you can get through the center of the universe dot org, um, the events page, and right on the events where you go Canada in space, uh, just go down and the ticket, the ticket, um, uh, the the little um, um, click for the tickets is just right there, and you can go and get them. Um, go and get them there. So, thank you very much, everybody. That's all I have for tonight. No, oh, no, no, no. bending light. The the bending light? Yeah. Yes. So, so the bending light is a is a special program that we're having actually on the twenty sixth. So this is the following Thursday that is going to be done, and um, it is a special program that has been um, put on, and it is a and because of the the copyright um, for this film, um, it can only be done like it can't be sent out to the public. Um, it has to be within a, a kind of a closed group or an organization. So we have put out the call to mem to members only of the Friends of the DAO. Um, just for your information, it costs $20 to become a friend of the DAO. So you might want to do that. But the bending light will be uh, will be on the Thursday, will be on the Thursday night. And we have also got on our website, there's also all the information for the bending for the bending light as well. So when is the email going out? Oh, it's already it's already gone. Oh, yeah. oh I haven't seen it yet. Okay. <laughs> Let me look at that. I'm sorry. Uh, I I certainly have gotten um, things, but um, I will I will look for that. It should be it should already be out there. Um, but again, it would not come out just as a general announcement to everybody. It would come out to people who are friends of the DAO and come out through the newsletter that comes through that. I received it on September 11. I missed it. Sorry. There you go. Okay, no problem. So. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. You're up. You're welcome. <laughs> David, you would like to talk about uh, the moon the observation. The moon. Oh you, oh, you mean Saturn? You mean Saturn yes. and the moon? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Did you prepare anything, um, Randy, or did you just want me to just jump right in? Well, well, I mean, yes, yes. I'll I'll share my screen. Okay, and then I'll share a detail near the end. Then, unless well, you already have it. So here we go. Oh, yes. Remember, if you come here, you get cookies. We're sending the cookies around. OK, so um, the uh, moon goes around the Earth once a month. And so these are pictures from August 21st when the occultation was visible between the UK and Tunisia. And so I featured a bunch of the pictures, which are going to be quite similar to what uh, we can see at four tomorrow morning. Um, but just to give you a flavor of it, that in order to take a picture that looks like this, you need some good equipment. But um, 
that, you know, it will still be really good even in a small telescope. So uh, this was from the UK. Uh, do I go this way? This one was from Tunisia. And what's kind of fun is, you know, I don't know if this is a real picture or not, because you usually can only see Titan. I don't know that I've ever seen the other moons. So this might be a fake. Mm. Or it it's two pictures with different exposures. I, I, I'm not sure. Well, it would definitely be different exposures because the moon is dramatically brighter. They're yeah. all going to be done in some sort of compositing they have to be, method. Yeah, Even it if, has to be yeah, a composite. Because you, you can't expose together like that. You wouldn't see one or the other properly. So here we are. Uh, oh, I don't know where this one was taken. That's going to be similar to what we're going to have uh, this uh, tomorrow morning. Now, this is a picture. Terry Legault is the most absolutely amazing lunar photographer. And he loves taking pictures of the space station with the moon. But here we have just a little <laughs> bit after the um, the occultation, here's the space station going by. So you've got the moon, Saturn, and the space station. He, he's, he's crazy. He, he travels the world <laughs> for these things. Um, oops, sorry, that's the wrong direction. And then this is in the UK again. And I think this was a picture every two minutes, or was it every five minutes? I forget. Now, one big difference is this is before full moon. You can see that the terminator is, no, no, this is after full moon. That's it. And, and we're going to see the terminator on this side, because it's going to be just before the full moon. That's the difference because Saturn moved over that month. Is that it? Yes, that's it. But in the Sky News newsletter, I wrote this up, and I'm sure everybody's already read this. Yes, this is an example of a syzygy. I would love to know why, you know, what's the etymology of that word, but it means when, when things in the sky line up. Syzygy. It's, it would, you can't even do that in Scrabble. I was thinking that'd be a good Scrabble word. It right? is. <laughs> it's a real word. <laughs> You're going to have to use a blank for that. Yeah. Anyway, um, it, we're just going to see the very end up here in North America. The, you know, But not many people are going to get to see it this time. But I took out Stellarium and took these screenshots and so this is at 409. It's going in. Uh, so there's the Cenus Iridium. So that's a very easy to see landmark. So it's going to be way up in the north. And then it's going to come out, uh, you know, 40 something minutes later, out by the Mare Crisium. It's and actually, it's right right across from Plutarch. Uh, I don't know if you can, uh, you can't really see it there. Uh, in my image, you can actually see it. Uh, but it's, um, it'll okay. come up pretty Default rapidly. Staring now. Yeah. And then when are you going to Cattle Point, David? Well, this is still debatable. I, uh, I'm still thinking of um, kind of alertness strategy. I thought of maybe taking a nap after this and then waking up maybe about one kind of loading up now obviously the entry point is not as critical as the reappearance because uh, i mean it won't be hard to find the entry point um but yeah the entry point i think is for sorry uh the the disappearance is i think around 407 so I want to be set up like at least an hour ahead. So I'll be there probably about three or so. That's my guess. Are you planning? Are you planning to go? For three o'clock. <laughs> yeah, you you live close by, so you can you can. can I'm I, not that just... close, but no, I'll be there three thirty ish, and I'm just going to bring my travel scope 
same mm -hmm. as Kirsten's, that uh, that three inch uh, Mac. Um, yeah, dep depending on the conditions, um, I might be better off with a smaller scope. Like I, I originally thought of bringing the C8 and I will still likely bring the C8, but I might just bring the four inch refractor instead. It's a little bit more portable and I don't, I actually don't have a deuce strap that's uh, big enough for the C8. So I may end up just bringing the four inch. But is anybody with, you know, a good rig at home going to try to photograph it? I don't know. Yeah, people could. It's in the south southwest, I guess. Uh, it's still fairly close to the horizon, I think. I don't think it's that far up. But you might have a good uh, vantage point. Somebody might have a good one. behind my neighbor's house. I don't think I'll. Oh, okay. And I got to work, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> two, that, two that's, what, why. That, that's what I figured. Like, most people would be looking at the insides of their eyelids. So, yeah. uh, I mean. There will be point. lots of pictures. Lots and lots of pictures on Facebook tomorrow. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there will be. I, I will make my attempt. I will uh, I'll bring a, a couple of cameras and. Uh, see what I can do with uh might even do lo-fi I'll I'll see maybe just use my camera my phone I mean I will watch vicariously through you <laughs> David. thank you I'm a, I'm a semi fair weather astronomer so I don't <laughs> I won't go to extreme extremes but this is not that extreme thank you and good night David <laughs> Brock, you have some photographs for us. Brock, if you're Brock, it, actually, if you're speaking, we you need to unmute. I, there you thank go. you. Thank you for the reminder. <laughs> Most of the pictures I take are kind of old news. They're of things that, you know, pictures of something a thousand light years away or millions of light years away. So, but just recently I uh, decided to aim a little more uh, close. And um, if you can see that, that's um, an image of Saturn that I took not that long ago. And you can even make out uh, Titan, the moon, just down below. Can you guys see that okay? We can. And then I, after getting that, I decided to add it to my collection. I have a, a, images I've been taking for a number of years going back um, five years in a row. And um, so I've added this to them. And as you can see, the, the our viewpoint of Saturn is changing. And it actually comes from how Saturn from Saturn's perspective, we're kind of almost near the sun. So essentially Saturn's going around us and it has, like Earth, it has a tilt. Instead of 23 degrees and change, it's 27-ish degrees. But as it goes around the sun, the view we get goes from sort of being able to see it sort of from above and then around it goes and we can start to see it from the side. And on March 23rd, 2025, the rings will be completely edge on although you won't be able to see it because it'll be kind of behind the sun. But if you could, it would be impossible to see the rings. And then and then after that, and next year, Saturn's actually going to look similar to this, what you see this year, except you're going to be seeing it from the underside of what you're seeing now. So, And then it'll go through a progression over the next seven years until you can see it really kind of more full on like you do over here on the left, but you'll be seeing it from the underside. So kind of nice to watch it over time. And then uh, another close to home, we had the solar telescope from the center up at the Saanich Fair. I brought it up and used it on, I think the, was it the Saturday or no, it's possibly. And then the following day I still had it and I set it up in my yard before I returned it to the center and I stole some time on it to gathered some photons and took a picture of the sun. The sun was very active. So there's some really nice solar prominences and lots of activity on the surface. Is that yeah. one photo? Well, it's it's a basically a bunch of video frames that have been 
captured and, and aligned and stacked to help bring out the detail. But you can get the prominences and all the texture at one exposure? I You actually kind of to the same point about what I was saying about Saturn and moon pictures. They're, they're basically, I need to stretch them separately. They're basically the same photo, but I masked out the, uh, the disc of the sun and, uh -huh. and then stretched the prominences separately. Mm -hmm. I also tried doing another run with a different exposure, basically blowing out the surface of the sun and, and trying to get the prominences, but it, it didn't actually help that much. So this, this worked well enough for what I was trying mm -hmm. to do. Which, which camera are you using, Brock? Uh, that was a mono. The mono, okay. The, uh, one of your mono planetaries, or? No, it was the 1600. 1600, okay. And then I did, I managed to get some time. Early mornings, I got up and uh, got some shots of Jupiter. So I had, we had some really good seeing. It was forecast, and I um, was up early. I sort of was... I didn't plan on doing it, but I was ready to do it. So I woke up just by chance at about four and I was like, okay, I'm going out. So I went out and got some shots of Jupiter. And Brock, you're capable you're Brock, you're capable of doing the Saturn thing this tomorrow morning. I am, but I, <laughs> it's gonna be behind a house. I'm pretty sure it's too low in the sky. My neighbor's house is sort of to the southwest. And there's some trees over the cedar trees over there. So I think I, I think I'm not uh even if I am awake, I'm not going to bother because I'm pretty 95% certain it won't be visible. And then I also, while I was out doing Jupiter, I pointed over at uh, Mars. And I, Mars, I'm showing really small. You can I can zoom in a bit. There's a bit of Mars surface detail there. But the reason I, I wanted to have it at the same scale as Jupiter, just to get a sense of how large it is in the sky, mm -hmm. it's clearly much smaller from a angular size in the sky and Bro and it'll Brock, be sorry sorry brock in each situation are you taking advantage of the atmospheric corrector yes oh, okay yeah all of the planet everything except for the picture of the sun i'm using the atmospheric corrector which makes a massive difference i've got yeah. actually if i go back to the beginning I think the one on the left here was without the atmospheric dis corrector and everything else to the right was with. And there's uh, definitely a difference in clarity there. Brock, could you explain the, the 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 use of the corrector? Absolutely. Yeah. So as the, I don't have any pictures to show it, but um, as the uh, light from most of the planets are quite low in the sky as they go through the ecliptic and and so as that light from a low angle comes through the atmosphere, the atmosphere refracts it. It's kind of like the light entering a prism. And so basically the light we get from any objects coming in at a low angle will be will be diffracted into a bit of a rainbow. So you'll actually see, um, you'll see the top of the planet will be bluish and the bottom will be reddish or the other way around, mm -hmm. I can't remember. Um, and basically, it's from the diffraction and there's or the, the dispersion, um, the diffraction at different uh, wavelengths is, is varies, which is called dispersion. And so you'll end up with sort of a rainbow fringing effect, which people sometimes think is something wrong with their optics, but it doesn't matter how good your optics mm -hmm. are. If you're looking through something at, at, at a low angle in the sky, mm -hmm. you're gonna have that issue. And there's a tool called an atmospheric dispersion corrector, which is, a little tool that has sort of an adjustable pair of prisms that allows you to sort of correct for that. It, it reverses that dispersion and and basically you can play with two little levers and and get that fringing to go away. And it makes quite a difference in doing planetary photography. And, and in fact, you could use it for viewing as well, I suppose, hmm. which would be a more, I've never tried it, but. I yeah, just, it. just, just for reference, uh, I think most of us uh seen the effect of this even if we didn't look at planets because yeah. if you watch the moon rise for instance you yeah. would see that kind of uh, uh refractive uh, effect for sure yeah that's all i've got thank you brock i 
I I see that I see that Natasha has uh, in the chat uh, has used find the uh, uh, find the found the origin of the word um, syzygy. 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 Okay. Yes, from Greek through late Latin. So it comes from sun and uh, zug zugnuel zugnuel to yoke. You're yoking the sun. Cool. Thank you, Natasha. Yes. <laughs> Boy. Up to the chin. Yeah. Just go to the top line. No. I'm lost for a moment. Just a moment wants me to leave the meeting and I'm not doing that. <laughs> okay. Okay. There we are. We're just reading it here in the room. So. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, um, yes, there are, there's, okay, goodbye. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, thank you very much. One more brief much. announcement. If it, oh, if one more brief time. announcement. Okay. Sure. Um, Sherry uh, posted earlier this evening that an X class CME um, has come toward the earth, kind of a glancing blow. And about half an hour ago, she noted that the conditions have been raised to a G4 KP8. So this could mean auroras tonight. Oh, along with the occultation. Right. Yeah. Oh, my. <laughs> yeah. So it's getting, it's getting more favorable for our area. Um, an app I have says that it's um, certainly in a band over um, Calgary area. Edmonton for sure, Calgary good, getting close to Vancouver, or maybe. Exciting. Yeah. Anything else that anyone has to say before we depart? I'm still looking for somebody to be tech next week. Again, it's not difficult, and it's uh, very pleasant. This was Kevin, your first time. Are you traumatized, or is it okay? Oh, mildly, yes. Mildly <laughs> <from him. laughs> He's not writing on the floor. Anymore. Looked good on our end. And Jeff Pivnik will be the uh, the host, and I happen to know he's going to talk about his trip to Peru. Oh. Hmm. Yes. Great. Thank you very much to everyone tonight for both being here and presenting and chatting. Lovely meeting and great information. Good night.